tremendous spirit of expectation, you know, in this church for the future about what God, not only what he has done, not only what he is doing, but what he's going to do. You know, really, I'm very excited about that. Now, you know, I talked last night about four areas of unity that guarantee success. What was number one? First area. Purpose. Purpose. Unity of purpose. Number two? Diversity. Unity and diversity. Number three? Unity under attack. And then number four, unity, unity in advancement. Because that's what we want. You really get somewhere fast when you're in unity and you're advancing. You know, I've got a little story. It's called the goose story. I don't know if you ever heard this. You know, in Canada, we see lots of Canadian goose. And, uh, yeah, do you? Oh, they come over here. But in the winter, they fly south. And then in the summer, they come back. Or in the spring, they come back. But listen to this. It says, next fall, when you see geese heading south for winter, flying in a V formation, you might be interested in the scientific explanation as to why they fly that way. As each bird flaps its wings, it creates an uplift for the bird immediately following. By flying in V formation, the flock can fly at least 71% farther than each bird flew on its own. People who share a common direction and sense of community can reach their destination quickly and easily because they share one another's energy. When the goose falls out of formation, it suddenly feels the drag and resistance of trying to go it alone. The goose quickly gets back into formation so it can take advantage of the power of the group. If we have as much sense as a goose, we'll stay in formation and travel with others who are headed in the same direction. It says, when the head goose gets tired, it rotates back and the wing and, and, the wing and other goose flies point. It pays to take turns doing demanding and difficult jobs. The geese at the back of the formation honk to encourage those up front to keep up their speed. Yeah. <laughs> It says, yeah, it says, what do, what do we say in traffic jams when we honk from behind? You say, look, get a move on. Get a move on. You're going too slow. When a goose gets sick or it's wounded by gunshots and falls out of formation, two other geese fall out with that goose and follow it down and lend help and protection. They stay with the fallen goose until it is able to fly or until it dies. Only then they launch out on their own <laughs> or join another formation so they can catch up with their group. If we have the sense of a goose, we'll stand by each other like that. Wow. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. In at least those four areas of unity. Isn't that great? Yep. It really is. I mean, if we did that, we'd, go, we'd all fly 70. We'd all get 71% faster yeah. and quicker. Glory to God. Now, I, gotta, I want to share this with you this morning. And if, we, if I can get a couple of guys to pass these out. Who we got? Uh, say, pastors right up there. Michael and then. We got someone else on the other side? Okay. You know, unity, I tell you, when you, when you, when you start acting together and, and doing things together as a group, you actually create a culture. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about today is a kingdom culture. I call it our victory culture of freedom and, and success. But it really is a kingdom culture. You know, and, uh, and, and these are things that we need to develop in our churches, in our groups, and, uh, and it will cause us to fly faster, it will cause us to go further, and it will cause us to certainly be on the same page so we can get more done. And so, uh, once you get these, just I'll wait until you, you all get them. So what were those four areas of unity again? Number one? Purpose. Purpose. Unity of purpose. Number two? Diversity. Unity and diversity were all different. Number three, unity, unity under attack. This is difficult because people can, this is where people can fall out, run away, hide in caves. But we need to be like the Jonathan and his armor bird. They're going to stand up and say, God's able to save by few or by many. It's a choice, isn't it? And then the, the last one was unity in advancement. Charge. We're going to moving somewhere together. We're going to take some territory together. Okay, everybody got one? Come on, guys, quicker. <laughs> vuba, vuba. Have you got them along the front? Right along here. Right along here. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Give one to Doctor Hill. Right here. She needs one. There we go. Good. Okay, you all set? Yep. Well, Father, we just say thank you for unity and harmony. We thank you for oneness of spirit. Yes. One spirit, one purpose, striving together for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, when you come to this church, may you see that. When you, when you hear about people that have been, let you, may we hear that we stand fast with one purpose, one spirit, one mind. And, uh, and of course, if you do that, then you'll end up with a victory culture. Mm. Or a kingdom culture. I, like, I prefer kingdom culture, but I believe that our victory, I also want victory to end up with this kingdom culture as well. Now, vision is a picture of the end result. But it's the culture, it's a culture and systems that bring the end result. Culture begins with the way you think, habits of thought, created, create inward attitudes that are expressed by behavior. Proverbs 23 and 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So it's important how we think. Culture influences behavior, and behavior influences culture. John 15, 7. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you will, and it'll be done unto you. And so it's, it's, it, there's, a, there's a powerful uh, combination there. Culture is what you feel when you walk into a place. Yep. You know, some places you walk into, and you can feel, man, this, is, this doesn't feel right in this place. You know, there's other places you can feel, you walk into and you feel peace. Yeah. You feel safety, you feel secure. You know, there's just a peace that comes upon you. You can feel joy. Man, this is a happy place. Man, you, you, there's certain things that you feel. You know, uh, and, and, and that's what we want to get. The right culture brings the right feel. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very catching, it really is. Uh, there's two kinds. Number one is explicit culture. It's written down. And I'm going to give you nine little points today. It's written down. And so you can learn it and practice it. And the other is implicit culture isn't necessarily written down. It's within someone's nature. They just, they just do it and you pick it up. Yeah. Not everyone will take a hold of the vision, but culture is contagious. Fire begets fire. Look at this, Acts 4.13. It says they realized that they had been with Jesus. They took note. These disciples in Acts chapter 4, they took note that they were ignorant and unlearned men but they spoke with such wisdom and boldness and miracles followed them. And then they took note that they had been with Jesus. It's catchy. You know, and I, you know when I was young here, I mean, in, in England, you only had either Catholic or Protestant. There was nothing else. You'd ask what the person was. I mean, they'd say, I'm Catholic, I'm Protestant. But that's all there was when I grew up. It really was. And, of course, just being in this country, you know, you, you picked up. Christian sayings, Christian principles, you know, and you began to walk in it, even if you weren't a Christian. It's just you picked it up. And that's why it's such a good country. That's why people want to emigrate to Christian countries that really are Christian countries because people pick up, the, they pick up that culture of doing what's right, of saying right, being kind, being polite, loving others. I mean, it's something we were brought up with since we were kids. Now, I tell you what, the devil wants to destroy that culture in all of the Western nations, and he's really doing a good job. I tell you, we've got to try and get it back, the culture back, into our own life, into our family, into our church, into our movement. And if we can get it in the churches of this nation, it'll be so catching that churches will be overflowing with people that really want to walk in wisdom and walk in love. And so, I put this, not everyone will take a hold of the vision, but the culture's contagious, fire begets fire. I'm going to give you nine qualities qualities that help create what I call the victory culture. I call it the victory peapod. Nine P's. Nine P's. You can be a nine P person or an eight P person or a seven P person or a six P person. You know, or a one P. But we'll all shoot for nine P. We're going to be a nine P. Let's look at the first P. The first nine qualities that help create what I call our victory culture. Number one, prayer. The spirit of prayer in, is the spirit of revival. The spirit of prayer is the spirit of revival. The spirit of prayer is a state of continual desire and anxiety of mind for the salvation of sinners. Paul called it prayer without ceasing. Prayer without ceasing. I prayed for you and I prayed for you and I prayed for you and I prayed for you. When you look at the Apostle Paul, it's almost like he spent his whole life praying. Then he says, I pray in tongues more than you all. 
Man, he was always praying in the spirit and praying with his understanding. Yeah. He was, you know. And I said, well, this is the spirit of prayer. For the burden of souls, it's such a burden to get on you, man. You've got to pray for people. And, and praying for their salvation and praying for their breakthrough. Number one. And then number two, praise and thanksgiving. David, David scheduled praise breaks throughout his day. Seven times a day, he says, I'll praise you. That's in Psalm 119, verse 164. Seven times a day. You know, so and instead of coffee breaks or tea breaks, you have a praise break. Right? Good. Yeah. yeah, sure. This is what he had. Seven praise breaks a day. He said, and I put here, if you want to change your environment and your attitude, start praising God throughout the day. Yes, then I tell you, it's amazing what happens. You get seven praise breaks. You know what? You, now instead of focusing on your problem, instead of focusing on the person that hurt you, now you're focusing on the God that can heal yes, you. Amen. You're focusing on the God that's got the solutions and the answers. And it's amazing how your attitude changes real quick, doesn't it? Yeah. It really did. When you started playing some of those songs next door, you know, Bob, Bob, you could sense the whole atmosphere changed. This morning when we come in and the music just changes the atmosphere. We're getting our eyes off of everything that can pull us down. And we're getting our eyes oh, up amen. onto the amen. King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's powerful. It really is. And it needs to become part of our culture. Seven praise breaks. Man. Yeah. What is that? Well, you just stop. I thank you, Lord Father. You're wonderful. And I give you thanks and praise and glory. I know what? In Africa, preaching in Africa... I, I had to stop saying, let's give thanks to God in the middle of a message. <laughs> Isn't that right? I mean, I said, well, let's give thanks to God. And then 20 minutes later, they're still thanking God and worshipping God. And Hazel would ask them sometimes, what are you thankful for? And this one guy said, well, I got a tambourine. And he got one, one clapper in it. I got a tambourine. And another somebody over here, what are you thankful for? Well, I got a chicken. <laughs> and they're so thankful and happy. Yeah. I think that's why they receive miracles so easily. Yeah. They're so thankful for what they've got. Yeah. I tell you, we've got lots and we're thankful for nothing a lot of times. Yeah. Isn't that right? We need to be thankful for everything yeah. that we have. Sure. And so, uh, praise and thanksgiving. It can change the environment. If you want change, uh, you change your environment and your attitude, start praising God throughout the day. Amen. I tell you, the power of praise is wonderful. Number three, purpose. And we talked about this last night. And that's the theme of this conference. Purpose for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It's not the glory, it's the knowledge of it. That means somebody has to spread it. That means somebody has to be talking about it. They're sharing the gospel of Christ and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and the whole earth being filled. Habakkuk 2 and verse 14 that is. And then of course Matthew chapter 24, 14. It says that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all nations and, uh, and, and then, the, then the, Lord, the Lord shall come. The Lord's going to return. So it's going to be preached everywhere. Somebody's going to preach it. You know? It's interesting in the book of Revelation, after the rapture of the church, it gives, it tells you this, there's four different ways the gospel's going to go around the earth. How many can, who can tell me the first one? Yeah, there's, there's going to be 144,000 Jews that are going to be sealed and they're going to take the gospel around the world. And then, and then there's going to be the two prophets, the two prophets that are, you know, that are going to come back and they're going to preach in, in uh, Jerusalem and in Israel, going to do signs and wonders. It could be Elijah and Moses, they're the same kind of signs that they did. And then, and then uh, what else? It says the angels, Revelation 14, angels don't preach the gospel now. It says then angels are actually going to preach the gospel in the New Testament, in the uh, book of Revelation. In the, you know, after the rapture's taken place, I tell you what, that, the angels are going to do it. Glory to God. And then of course there's the tribulation saints. Mm -hmm. So four ways the gospel is going to go around the earth. You know, and it's going to get around the earth. It's our turn now. now it's our, yeah, we've got the opportunity now to take it around yeah, the world. I mean, we've got media, we've got everything. Mission trips, we've got everything to take the gospel around the world. And we're doing our best to make that happen. But it's, uh, no matter how much we try, you know, we're not going to be able to reach every soul. This is when in, in, the, uh, in the book of Revelation it's going to happen. You know, glory to God. And then 144,000 are raptured. The two witnesses are raptured. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? It really is. And, and so, anyway, our turn's coming. Yeah. So, purpose. Number four, I think it's good. Like we said last night, purpose becomes like what? Your magnetic north. north. Oh, 
It's the magnetic north, the compass, where it goes towards the north. It doesn't matter what kind of conditions are out there, it still points towards the north. Absolutely. That means it's pulling everything in that direction. You know, the energies, the gifts, the talents, the finances, the resources, everything is being pulled towards the purpose. Yeah. And it's the magnetic north of every, every organization. Mm -hmm. That is their magnetic north, whether they know it or not. Some don't know it, therefore they've got no pull. Some churches don't know it, therefore they've got no pull. I tell you what, if you can, if you got the vision, and ours is one, our, our purpose is one that can, that, that, that can you, you can understand it with your intellect, but it captures your imagination. Wow. Reaching every available person by every available means, you know, at every available time with the gospel of Jesus Christ. How can I do that, Lord? Give me a creative idea on how I can reach my neighbors, how I can reach my family, how I can reach the people in this city. Give us some creative ideas. We don't want to just copy what others have done, do we? Don't want just to be a cheap imitation of somebody else. We want God to give us his plan, his purpose. And so, uh, number, so there's a purpose, and then number four is partnership. Great visions require great partners. Lovely. Partnership, we are going somewhere together. The Apostle Paul said of his part uh, partners, you are all partakers with me of grace. Mm -hmm. That's in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 7. They worked with him. And that same grace that was on him came upon all his partners. Glory to God. Amen. And then of course, in verse 27 is one that we quoted at the beginning. When I, I want to hear about you, that you stand fast with one mind, one spirit, striving together for the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's grace for that. Grace is God's goodness. How many know grace can be seen? Yes. He really can. Acts 11.23, yes. it says, Barnabas, when he came to the church, uh, or came to Antioch, he says he could see the grace of God. And he was glad. He saw the grace of God on the Gentiles. It means the goodness of God was there. And it was recognized, it was recognized. You see, so we need to, partners you need. A vision will never be accomplished without, without partners. You know, it takes good partners. You know, I, some have got a vision but no partners. The vision's impossible. Some have got a vision and they've got bad partners. And a vision becomes a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> some have got a vision and they've got partners they're developing and there is potential and then there's some that have got a vision and a purpose and they've got good partners that means it's inevitable it will take place and that's what we're looking for and so these are all things so a partnership and then passion we do what we do with feeling we are passionate about our purpose. Passionate about the music. Man, you're involved in the music team. You, that should be, that should be, so you should be so passionate about your involvement in the worship. You're leading people into the presence of God. Teaching children. I'm passionate about it. That's the most important person, part of the church. This is the most important. Your part, the thing you've got passion for, should be, should be, the number one passion, of course, should be, uh, we, should, we should be Christ's number one passion. We should tap into Christ's number one passion. What was his number one passion? Souls. Souls. He came to seek and save that which was lost. So all of our passions should be submitted to his number one passion. Yes, that's good. Very good. So whatever our passion is, if it's children, we're teaching them the gospel. If it's business, we're making money and we want to touch the, God, touch the people through our business and through the way we run it with integrity. You know, and kindness. You know, and, and, and whatever we're doing, we want it to tie in to the heavenly vision, reaching Amen. souls for Christ. You see, that's what gives you, that's what gives meaning and value and purpose to our lives. It really is. And so, passion. What we do, we do with feeling. We're passionate about our purpose. And then number six is pastoral. We are relational. We care. People are our most valuable asset. And then number seven is professional. We always strive for excellence. It doesn't mean you're, you're the best in the world, but you do your best. Yeah, right? As a principle my wife and I live by is, is we do our best. Everything we can do according to wisdom and knowledge. We do our best and then we trust God for the rest. Absolutely. Yeah. Huh? Sometimes you do your best and it still doesn't work out. But then you trust God for the rest. And he can add that rest to you, whatever it is. And then, uh, and then uh, number seven is we're professional. We always strive for excellence. 
Let's do our best. You know, really, biblical success. You know, you, you talk about success in life. I mean, if you can compare yourself with others, you can feel, almost feel like a failure, can't you? But a, there is a, a, biblical, a definition for biblical success that I came up with from Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, where it says, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. We're going to walk worthy of that. So, I, I defined biblical success as knowing what you're called to do and then seeking to excel in it. If you know what you're called to do and you're seeking to excel in it, then you're a success. Doesn't matter how everybody else is doing. It's you. You know, this is what God has called me to do. I was born for this. And I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. You know, and because you're doing my part and you're doing it with the best of your ability, you are a success. That's true. Huh? Yep. And it's different for each and every one of us. You see? And then, uh, then uh, number eight is progressive. This means we are an apostolic, visionary, forward thinking, what's next kind of people. Amen. Huh? Yeah. What's next? Okay, I've done that. What next? Okay, I've got to this level. What next? Where do we go now? Been through the discipleship program. What next? Yeah, well, now you've got to be mobilized. So now you've got to do this. Okay, I've done that. What next? And there's new challenges that are coming along all the time. Visionary, apostolic, prophetic people. Where men, we are going somewhere. And it's forward thinking. You're seeing beyond where you are. It says in Galatians 3 and verse 8, the scriptures foreseeing. It means just even understanding the scriptures, you foresee some things. You see beyond where you are at to where you need to be. Psalm 92 and verse 10, David said, anoint me with fresh oil that my eyes might see and my ears might hear. I pray that for myself continually. My eyes might see, my ears might hear. You know, if you, if you see what you've never seen before yeah. and you hear what you've never heard before, then you can do what you've never done before. Some people are not getting any new thoughts. They're not getting any new ideas. I tell you, we've tapped into the creator of the universe. He has all kinds of great income producing ideas. He has all kinds of great church gro growth and church planting ideas. He's got all kinds of ideas that can grow your business, grow your family. He's got all kinds of great ideas and he wants to give you one. Yep. Isn't that right? Amen. Jeremiah 33 3, what does it say? Call unto me, and I will answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. I tell you, you've got to call on him, but then you've got to be listening too. Call on him. I tell you what, a lot of people are too vague in their prayers. You know, if, if you're too vague in your prayers, you're praying in generalities, you, 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 oh, you miss the answer. You know, you don't even recognize an answer when it comes. You got to pray specific. I'm praying for this one. The salvation of this one. Now, when they get saved, that's an answer to your prayer. <laughs> I'm praying for God to put this family together. And then when it comes together, it's an answer to your prayer. Specific. I'm praying for this job and this person to get that job. Specific. That is wonderful. Nothing becomes dynamic till it's specific. Good. You're going to have a specific. Nothing becomes dynamic. It becomes dynamic when it's specific. Yeah. Don't be too general in life. I tell you what, there's a general vision that we should all fulfill. Just as a Christian, you know, we should all, we should all fulfill the great commandment and the great commission. They're the two things that every one of us should do or seek to do. Yeah. The great commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then the great commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Telling them about Christ. There are two things everyone needs to do. And then out of that, a specific call comes. Mm -hmm. A specific call to different aspects. To the hurting, to the broken, to the wounded, to people, to marriages, to families, to missions, you know, to, to, to children. Different aspects, music. Whatever. Specific call. But it begins with the general. Start with the general. Some people don't know do the general, therefore they never get the specific. It comes out of that. You see, so it's progressive. We're apostolic. Visionary. Forward thinking. Don't you like it? What's next kind of a people? You know? Because, you know, I mean, if you've only got one goal and then you arrive, ha, I've done it. I got it. I tell you, I, I thought I'd arrived after six months of being a Christian. <laughs> I did. I mean, here I am. You know, I've stopped all the outward stuff. 
you know, all the stuff we do, just out of here and out of here. I mean, I'd stopped all of that six months. Don't just all dropped off and I worked at it. And I thought, man, I got, I've arrived. I'm pretty much like Jesus now. You know? <laughs> I got rid of all that stuff. Holy George, you know? I mean, <laughs> but, but you know what? Here's the thing. Then you get closer to God through worship, through prayer you're talking to God, all of a sudden you get closer and it's like all of a sudden the light goes on, doesn't it? Yep. It's like in here. If there was a, a big sunbeam came through this place, what would you see? You'd see all dirt in the air. I mean, you see, you think, well, man, this place is filthy. Huh? Yeah, I mean, the particles in the air, that's what happens when we get close to God and through worship, through praise, you can get away with stuff out there when you're far away from God. But I tell you what, you get into God's presence. Oh man, it's impossible to get into the presence of God who's called holy, holy, holy by the angels without feeling your need for repentance. And there's cleansing that comes with that. You know, so, yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, so, yeah, so God kept revealing. Thank God he only revealed one thing at a time. <laughs> What now, Lord? Oh, just this one thing, George. Ah, oh, yeah, go sell all you have, give it to the poor. Ah, oh, is that all? <laughs> That's what he told one person, wasn't it? Yeah. The rich young ruler, he'd go and sell everything, give it to the poor. And of course, he, he walked away sorrowful, but imagine if he'd have done that. See, the scripture says, no man. This is the scripture that God gave to Hazel and myself. Mark 10, 29 and 30. No man gives up anything. Lands, homes, families, possessions. You don't give up anything for the gospel and for my sake, he says, without being rewarded 100 fold in this life and in the life to come. Friends, family, homes, etc, etc. With persecution, of course, he says that. Just throws that in there. <laughs> You're going to read that real quick. <laughs> How many, you know, not everybody's going to like you just because you're blessed. Not everybody's going to like you because you're born again and you speak in tongues and go to church. Huh? I mean, at the time when you first get saved, you think that. Oh man, everybody needs this. Oh man, I'm going to tell all my friends, they'll all love this. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you get this reaction. Well, people get mad and, and then they begin to, you know reject you but you know what hey it, it's not them we're serving we're serving Christ aren't we Amen. you see so um, a, a progressive and then the last thing number nine is positive we have a positive faith attitude that looks for the good yes. believes the best and is willing to take a risk on people yeah. I tell you, that's what I call the victory spirit. The victory spirit. Positive. Some people are so negative. They really are. You know, we must, number one, learn our DNA. Let's learn it. These nine Ps will create our DNA. So we can get it in. And then number two, teach our DNA. So that is every area of our lives and ministry. It's in your home. It's in the children's ministry. It's in the worship team. It's in the outreach ministry. It's in the, in the, in the next door, in the hub. Every part of the ministry. This, these nine Ps are there. And then eliminate things outside of our DNA. Man, there's things outside it. Eliminate them. I know even in our pre-service prayer meeting when I first started pastoring, there used to be one of our deacons that prayed so negative. Man, he was, you know, you'd think the whole church was falling apart. I thought it was going pretty good. And he'd go, oh, Lord, you know how terrible this is and how terrible that is. And I want you to do something about this. And this is like this and this is like that. Uh, he was from England, by the way. <laughs> It was the coronation kind of street mentality, you know. <laughs> I, just, I, I mean, finally I got so mad. I, I mean, here we are, there's a whole bunch of us praying. I, I dragged him out of the room. I wasn't, had been saved all that long. So <laughs> I've got to hold him. I put him out. I said, don't you ever pray like that again. I said, she's depressing everybody. Yeah. Huh? Put him in pre-service prayer. Just depressing everybody, discouraging everybody. And uh, I, I tell you what, he, he never prayed that way, that way again. <laughs> and he stepped off the deacon board, <laughs> which was a blessing. <laughs> he stayed in the church. But he stayed in the church, became one of our pastors eventually. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Willing to change. See, people can change. 
But I tell you what, somebody needs to confront them. You know, if you're negative all the time, I tell you what, you, 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 you pull the whole team down. One negative person can destroy every good idea and every good project. Let's, get, let's watch our tongue. Let's watch our tongue how we speak. And let's get it filled with praise firstly. Yeah. Catch somebody doing something good and praise them for it. Yeah. Stop looking to catch people doing bad. Amen. I tell you, look for good. If you look for the good and you catch them doing something good and thank them for it, man, that's really good what you did. That was great praise and worship this morning, guys. That was really good yeah, praise and worship yesterday. You know, to Stuart, really good praise and worship this morning with Matt and the team. Yeah. It's great. Really is, catch them doing something good and praise them for it. Yeah. You'll get much more yeah. out of them. Yeah. You yeah. really will. And you'll feel better, they'll feel better. And it's amazing what can happen. It really can. And so, we learn our DNA. That's these nine P's. Teach. And then we teach. teach our DNA. So that's in every area of our lives and ministries, in your family, Amen. with your wife, with your kids, with your husband. Yeah, it's, it's in there. And then eliminate things outside of your DNA. And then live out the strength of the DNA. Imagine what would happen if these nine Ps formed the normal culture of our lives. Huh? Yeah. Imagine what would happen. That you'd live free and you'd fly high. It says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 2, it says, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath set us free from the law of sin and death. Sin and death will take you down, but the law of the spirit of life will take you up in Christ Jesus. These nine P's will take you up. These nine T's will take you as an individual, take the children's ministry up, it'll take your small groups up, it'll take your worship team up, it'll take everything up to a brand new level, and then people will recognize it changes the atmosphere, it changes the environment, and they'll say, man, there's something different about this place. I know already people come in and say that. People come in and say that already. Something different about this place. I like it here. And people drop in. Yeah. I tell you, but it can be even better. Oh, amen. Man, amen. there's a presence in this place. And then when people come into this place, and then to be here for a little while, they become a victory person too. A kingdom person. Where these nine Ps, they may come in a one P person. <laughs> we should evaluate ourselves. I mean, hey. You, how, how, how do you score on this? Are yourself, are you a 1P? <laughs> are you a 2P? You're a pod with 1P in it maybe. Maybe, you, maybe your P is... I don't know, maybe you are positive. That's the 1P you have. Huh? You just don't want to be a PP person. No, you just want to be a PP. <laughs> if you've got 9Ps, you know I mean, hey, imagine... Imagine your wife or your husband being like this. I mean, she's got the spirit of prayer. He's got the spirit of prayer on him continuously. Praying for the family, praying for the kids, praying for the church, praying for the country, praying for people that are sick and hurting and broken. They're continually giving praise and thanksgiving seven times a day. Man, this guy's praising all the time. Huh? Look at him. He's stopping again. Get back to work. <laughs> Is that all you do all day long is praise? Well, David did, didn't he? And David's the greatest warrior they had. And the wisest. You know, so I tell you what. I mean, hey, praising God is not wasting time. Amen. Waiting on God is not wasting time. Amen. All it's doing is preparing you for, for the great things that God has ahead. Together we can live free, stay free, and fly high. Glory to, God. Glory to God. So Father, I say thank you for that in the wonderful yes, name Lord. of Jesus. You, want to, you might want to put this in your Bible. Just stick it in the back of your Bible. And then see how you grow in these areas. If there's one you're weak in, if you're a very negative person, practice being positive. If you're a very unthankful person, practice thanking God for everything. And anything. Even in the bad times. Find something good to thank Him for. Everything. That's just amazing how it'll change your life. Thankful. What time am I? Quarter to. Quarter to, okay. You know, I was, I was reading, you're talking about thankfulness. Um, Matthew Henry, you know the man that wrote the, um, the Matthew Henry's commentary? It says, uh, it says one day, he's, in his journal he writes, one day I was robbed. And then he says, uh, and he's finding something to be thankful for. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And so, he, now he's looking for something in this situation. He'd been robbed. 
And then he says, number one, Father, I thank you. This is, this is the first time I've ever been robbed. <laughs> and, if, <laughs> and, then, and then he says, after, and then secondly, he put in it, Father, I thank you that even though they took my money, they didn't take my life. Yeah. And then, then he says, Father, I thank you that even though they took my all, it wasn't much. <laughs> And then, and then fourthly, this is all in his diary, in, in Matthew Henry's diary, the day he was robbed. You know, and then the last one he says, well, Father, I thank you that, uh, that I was the one robbed and not the one doing the robbing. Amen. Isn't that great? Amen. Yeah. Wouldn't that change your attitude right there? Absolutely. I mean, you change your attitude right away and all of a sudden there'd be something positive in your spirit. Yeah. Glory to God. It's hard, to, it's hard not to be positive when you're giving thanks for pretty much everything. Somehow, some way. Unthankful people can be very negative. And so, Father, I just say thank you for these oh, nine Ps. Help us, Lord, I pray, to establish these nine Ps in our life. Yes, that we might be nine P men. Yes. Nine P women. <laughs> Amen. And, Father, we rejoice in just the atmosphere being developed, the culture being developed. When people walk into this place, they'll sense it. And they'll want to be a part of it. Thank you, Lord. Make this place a magnet, I pray. Amen. Make it a magnet that people will be attracted to yes, people in this place. Yes, they'll be drawn in. They'll receive you as Lord and Savior. And they'll be discipled and become like Jesus. Amen. And Father, we say thank you for that in the wonderful Amen. and powerful and mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, give Jesus a big hand. Woo! Amen. You know, Barb and I have had the privilege of traveling quite a long, a lot of places with Drs. George and Hazel. And I remember our last trip up to Scotland. All of a sudden, from the front of the car, Pastor Hazel was up.